nice, nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Jean Mason, for letting us listen to your music. Um, Jean Mason can be found on practically every place that you like to listen to music at. Um, that was on iTunes. He's also on um, iHeartRadio. So Jean Mason, again, thank you for letting us play your music on our podcast tonight. As you will see, we have a mostly, well, no, we do. We have an all male panel tonight um, and one of my favorite poets and also family is the son so we're going to bring him on right now and talk to him and he is our artist spotlight for tonight hi how are you doing you're on mute i sure am i'm great how are you doing <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good. Yeah, good. Like this bright light on my face bothered me. <laughs> so yeah. tonight you are our artist spotlight and we always have um, artists on our podcast because we would like to spotlight, showcase local artists, whether you're a poet, a musician, um, anything, anything artistic we have a spotlight here on every episode. Um, we are now into our eighth episode and tonight we're gonna be talking about trauma and relationships. So Desana, I asked you to come on and I asked you, do you have a strong relationship piece for us? And you told me that you did. So I'm excited to hear um, your piece and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um... So this piece is actually called um, Ashamed. And in thinking about the conversation, um, I thought about this piece that I wrote um, for someone um, in my life um, as, they were move, as they were working their way through um, a difficult situation. She fell in love with his locks, never knew he was a demon, head full of serpents, should have known by the hiss she told me it was his lisps, said she melted from his kiss and went from PM to the dawn in memory bliss, never realizing his true aim. He lynched her independence with a mob of mind games, sometimes they're gorillas in the mist. How many men offer a genie in a bottle and never come off the wish? See, commitment doesn't look like this. Playing with her emotions like a djembe, tapping on goat skin, no hope skin thin, so bruises chessboard beauty and I want to check your mate. See, I've never been good at chemistry. Now I'm trying to find the temperature when love turns to hate. I can't scale back the impact and can't measure the weight. Train of thought off track. She can't carry the freight. Railroaded in despair. I blow kisses into air so that comfort finds her when the wind blows. Now tell her, you found a magician between the sheets, hoped for sleight of hand, and his was heavy with each spell cast, the illusion that it would end. Attempted murder on your perseverance, and I thought it was a sin. Warp record of abuse as this cycle spins and see he did it again, did it again, did it again. And imagine if love found refuge in your heart like castaways find open beds in homeless shelters, if tears hardly came like most women's orgasms, if you claimed your happiness like responsible fathers nurtured the tomorrow you deserve, you could have faith in romance like Big Mama's faith in the word and let there be light. Commitment has to come other than in the middle of the night. So out of chaos comes the sun. Lord, let thy will be done on this earth where his in intentions sprout from that devil's head as it is in heaven, where she finds her strength and conviction. Thought he was a hell of a good guy. Passion she thought was rooted in his mind, said that was the root of the red in his eyes. Should have paid attention to the sign. Stop. Looking into her eyes is like peeking in the windows of a house Joy never made it out of. And I want to dial 911. This disturbance isn't domestic, it's an import. He brought this madness here, forced her to swallow her pride. Intoxicated in confusion, he kept the keys to escape and told her not to drink and drive. And I tell her that freedom is in your declaration of independence. And honestly, you're able. This penny got a whole lot to overcome, but it's not hopeless. See, she fell in love with his locks. And I dread to think how dependency has her locked in the serpent's grass as he squeezes an angel so she can't fly. Feeds her poison with his lies and should have known by the hiss. You said it was his lisp. 
Never believe a word he uttered. Knew he was fake from the first time he stuttered. I should have saved you. Warned you to beware his kiss and saved you from being bitten by his fists. Wow. <laughs> that was definitely fitting. Um, as everyone knows or should know is October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And um, as a survivor of domestic violence, it's really important to me to be able to um, talk to men and to be able to have men that understand the impact of domestic violence um, on relationships. Um, but then also just being able to say that it actually does exist and that that actually does ha happen um, is very important to have men in this fight and for men to be advocates um, for domestic violence or against domestic violence, should I say. Um, the other thing is, is that it's important for people to know that men can be victims of domestic violence as well. Um, men can uh, be hurt, men can be killed, men can um, go through emotional abuse, verbal abuse, all forms of abuse. Um, unfortunately, a lot of men, because of pride, ego, or fear, do not report it because they might feel as if it makes them look less manly. But in my opinion, when you're fighting for your rights to protect yourself and your life, that is being manly. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. And I look forward to your second piece to close us out for the night. You are welcome to, to stay in the conversation as we talk to, um, I am Sean Smart. <laughs> But before we do that, Desan, tell everybody where they can find you um, on social media. Uh, yes, uh, it's Desan Ahanu everywhere, D-A-S-A-N-A-H-A-N-U, across all platforms. Very nice, very nice. Well, I am definitely uh, grateful for you sharing your, um, your piece with us, and it definitely fit right into what it is that we are um, talking about tonight. Um, as I mentioned, tonight is domestic, well, this month is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, we're gonna be talking to um, Spike or Sh Sean Smart um, tonight. And we're gonna be talking uh, specifically about trauma and how it affects relationships um, from a male point of view. And so um, that we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. It looks like he went off screen for a second. Oh, there he is, hi there. <laughs> Um, so yes, we're going to be talking um, about trauma and about relationships and um, what that looks like um, for, from a male's perspective. But then also we're going to talk about how trauma and um, toxicity affects relationships and it affects how you go into relationships. So thank you tonight, um, Mr. Smart. <laughs> I'm used to calling you Spike, so when I see when I see the smart, I'm Sean Smart. I'm just like, wait, it, 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 you know, all the S's are tripping me up here. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. I know that this is something that we have been talking about um, since we met, is doing something together and talking about relationships. So um, tell everybody about you, you know, who you are and why this topic. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. And like I said, it's been a long time coming. We've been doing some planning on, <clears throat> on being together on some different things. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, me personally, I am a, a entrepreneur, father of three, um, someone who's passionate about relationships across the board, whether they be intimate relationship, business, um, <clears throat> relationships between, um, you know, mother, daughter, son, father. This positive relationships is is possible um, when it when it's dealing with you know just people who <clears throat> or have been traumatized and really probably don't know it um, because I think a lot of us deal with trauma and it carryovers into our relationships, uh, whether it be business or personal. So um, just knowing that and being a person that deals with trauma. Um, I just been really like, um, like hell bent on speaking, making, speaking about relationships and how to get better and solutions. Um, we have a lot of platforms, but for me, I look at 
people want to just talk about the negative, but nobody is really focusing on solutions. How do we get better and things like that? So from that standpoint, that's how, you know, it came for me to want to start speaking about relationships and trauma and things like that. Right. Um, do you care to share your experience with trauma? Well, my, my experience with trauma began as a child. Um, I, I watched my aunts, uh, my mother um, be beaten. Uh, they were in a lot of trauma uh, relationships where they grew up in era where men did a, you know, not that the saying men don't do a lot of beating on women now, but, you know, they grew up, my father and his brothers, you know, grew up not knowing that they had been traumatized by watching their mother be beaten and, and mm -hmm. happen when you watch stuff like that happen, either you're going to hate it or you're going to be a victim of doing it because you think it's right. Um, and so for me growing up seeing it, um, I was on the opposite end of it. You know, I was like, I hated it. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I never wanted to be a person that run around jumping on, you know, women beating them and just being a terrible person. But with having that trauma, I still had my issues as well. Um, when I didn't know how to not be toxic. I didn't know how to communicate without arguing and fighting and, and things like that, because that's all I saw. You know, I didn't see a lot of, um, you know, great relationships growing up. And so it took for me to get older to want to, to search for something better because I knew there was better uh, avenues to have relationships and be able to communicate um, not have to fight and arguing and, you know, people just tearing up, you know, themselves either verbally or physically. And so for me, man, I, I just grew up seeing a lot of stuff and um, it just kind of led me down a path of my life where I wanted, I knew there was better. I just didn't know what, what, but I just kept researching um, and you know, I, I just learned some different ways to be able to communicate. And I still now at 44, I'm still learning um, because I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not fully healed from that that I saw as a child. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, one of my things that I saw. I saw a bunch of abuse and stayed in, in environments that was um, was violent growing up. And so, you know, I, I uh, you know, I kind of interjected and reflected some of that stuff growing up in, in my life as well, so. Yeah, um, I can definitely um, understand that um, very well. Um, I know growing up, I saw a lot of things that in my household that I probably should not have seen. Um, I've never witnessed uh, my father hitting my mom, but there was a lot of things that were, um, abusive in nature, like emotionally, verbally. Um, and then there were some things that happened in the house that um, were abusive towards me. And so I had very toxic relationships as a result of growing up in a negative relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they didn't start having a healthy relationship <laughs> until I was grown and I was an adult. But growing up, I saw a lot of things in my house that um, were, were not good, were not healthy, not something that a child should be exposed to. Um, and so it affected me in my relationships. I thought that love was being cursed out, calling names, you know, cheating, doing this, doing that. Um, and it was it was very hard for me growing up to know that that's not the way relationships are supposed to be because I witnessed those relationships as a child. Um, right. Yeah. So what kind of things from your childhood do you feel that you took into relationships? Like what were some of the behaviors that you took into relationships? Um, for me, some of the things that I took into relationships was um, not being emotionally available. Um, I didn't see a lot of affection towards women growing up. So lack of affection, um, lack of like understanding and emotions. 
um, we like to say that women, you know, are emotional beings. So that lack of, you know, touch or um, confirmation of, you know, how you feel about them, letting them know a lot of men think just actions, you know, because I, I pay the bills or I do this, I do that. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to show anything else. And so, you know, not seeing that, um, you know, thinking that screaming and yelling was a sign of love. Like, yeah, I know she know I love her because I'm arguing, I'm cussing, we fussing. You you think that's, you know, you think that's normal. And so some of those things definitely took into my relationships um, until I, I felt like, you know, I really don't want to go through that anymore. And it's not that it doesn't happen because I, you know, growing now, I still get into, um, you know, confrontations, but now I know how to handle them different. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I handle them better. Um, and so that anybody that's listening don't mean that, oh, okay, so you don't have any, it's no, no, that's, that's not the, the case, but I just know how um, to try to deal with them better. And so as you get, if you go on, you, the more that you try to research to get better, I say, I like to say relationships are no different than trying to, I said top, being, growing up saying toxic things, just dealing with relationship is no different than trying to heal yourself physically from a disease or anything it's that you have to constantly be trying to get better. Yeah. Um, and Anytime that you stop um, learning and your person or you're learning yourself is where it, it, you know, you relapse. It's just like any type of sickness, you know, it could be drugs or whatever. The day that you, you stop trying to get better or, or you don't think that you have a problem or there's not a problem is when you relapse. And so just constant learning. So those things that I took in were, you know, lack of emotion, lack of time, lack of sympathy um thinking that I had to be the, the the macho tough guy um I couldn't show emotions and things like that yeah um well unfortunately you already know that um with men or with boys you, uh, boys are taught to not show their emotions and they're taught not to um cry and they're taught not to, you know to be tough and so forth and so on I remember my my son I mean my my son had fell down or something. He was maybe one, two years old. And no, he was older than that, maybe three or four years old. And my dad said, stop that crying, man up. And I'm just like, he's a boy, he's a child. Um, so one thing that I've always done with my son is I told him it's okay for you to express how you feel. It's, it's okay to express your emotions. Um, and it's also okay to talk about your feelings. Um, so did you ever go to counseling or did you work through this on your own? Or did um, you figure I, this on your own? I went to limited counseling. I'm actually um, about, I'm about to get back into counseling. Um, for the most part, it was just, I knew that something wasn't right. And so I just, you know, researched a lot of stuff on my own, um, had, had talks like these um, where with others that were dealing with some other, you know, similar same things, you know, dealing with trauma and recognizing that, you know, what we, we grew up seeing wasn't right, you know, and everything that we learned wasn't right. Um, for instance, just like you're saying, boys are taught not to cry and all that, but then when you got a man that grew, grows up this don't know how to deal with his feelings, don't know how to communicate when he hurts and when he hurt and he's holding all this in because the world has told him that, you know, boys don't do this. Boys don't cry, boy, you know, that's soft. Then you got this, you know, this this dude that's just running around with with no feelings or well, don't know how to express his feelings. Because he that part of his life has been locked off. Um, you know, you just have to, you know, figure it out on your own a lot of times. And some people leave here not trying, no, not knowing. But for me, it was just a bunch of self-taught uh, things. Everything that I've probably learned has been self-taught. I've, I've had limited counseling. Um, I probably had maybe a year's worth of counseling. 
if that. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I, I know for me, um, counseling was important to be able to talk through those feelings of, you know, anger and um, going in and out of bad relationships and allowing certain things to happen in relationships instead of realizing this is a way out or needing to be out. Um, so if it wasn't for counseling, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think I would be here um, because it was just really important for me to talk to someone that I didn't know that also had um, the specialty of working with, with people um, or victims of child abuse and child molestation, um, rape, and so forth. So it took for me to reach out to a counselor that reached out to a specialist and what I what I exactly needed. Right. So I didn't just go to any counselor. I went to a counselor that specialized in what I needed. Um, so we weren't only addressing the depression. We were uh, addressing the abuse. We were addressing the sexual assault. We were addressing the domestic violence. Um, right. But then we were also addressing, like, why are you still doing these things? Why are you putting yourself in these positions? Why are why is this happening um, with me? So not only did I have to look in the past, and I had to learn to forgive those who hurt me, but I had to learn how to forgive myself. Um, and that was really, really key to me starting to heal, is being able to forgive myself, knowing that I was a child. And that what happened was not my fault. And that when I was raped, I did, didn't do anything. I deserved mm -hmm. that to happen. So um, forgiving myself was really, really key. Um, you said that you witnessed your, uh, your mom being hit. Was this by your biological dad or was this by someone else? Oh, yeah. Biological dad. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was probably the the last person to ever put his hands on my mom. Um, and that was because she had reached a point that wasn't no other man going to ever hit her again. And I had reached the age that no other man was going to hit her again. <laughs> uh, so I thank God that nobody did that because I probably wouldn't be here right now. Or I'd probably just be coming home or something like that. It could be uh, one of those situations. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I watched that, uh, and, you know, dealing with relationship with him, it, it took me some time, you know, to kind of, you know, truly like forgive him because she had, you, you know what I mean? They was mm -hmm. able to relationship moving forward after, you know, years of her being able to, you know, heal from that situation. Um, and so as in my, in, in my quest of getting better, I had to understand who he was and what type of environment he grew up watching. You know, not only did I watch him, but I watched his dad do the same thing to my grandma. Right. So, right. you know, and I just saw a little bit of it. I couldn't imagine growing up in the household all that, all those years until he was about 17, I think he left home. And so, you know, you're growing up in a culture where women were really looked at as only being able to be home providers, cleaners, this, that, and the third. They didn't have a lot of um, freedoms and, you know, uh, you know, freedoms for us, you know, what you think or looking at as a woman as a thinker or outside of being a labor, a labor man in the household. You, does that make sense? And so, yeah. you know, um, you know, and I had to, you know, like go through that and forgive him. Even our relationship today is not, it's not good. You know what I mean? It's not because I haven't tried and tried and tried and tried, but I'm just at the point where, you know what, I've tried, you know, you have to do some more, you know, you have to do some, some self healing on yourself. I can't do it for both of us. Um, and so, yeah, seeing him, seeing my granddad, and you know, seeing some of my uncles, um, you know, that I'm not making no excuses for them, but it's, it's, you know, they were sick. You know what I mean? It was trauma that they didn't, you know, that they didn't even know. They thought it was okay. You know what I mean? They thought this is what you're supposed to do. Um, right. And so, 
you know, just moving forward, um, you know, I was able to forgive him just like people have for, for giving me for things. You know what I mean? I'm I'm no better than one else. You know what I mean? So Right. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think and I asked you that question, was it your biological dad? Because I do think that that makes a difference in um, the effects. I mean, seeing your biological dad versus maybe mom's boyfriend, even though they both have ne negative effects, it's something it's something far more when it's your biological father. Um, and so, you know, when those traits are there, and you know, other there's other males in the family who are also have also shown abusive, you know, behaviors then it's really, really hard for you to have a role model or for a young man to have a role model when that's what he's seeing in his family, especially when it's someone that is supposed to be protecting mom and protecting you, um, not hurting you, not hurting mom. Um, so now you are all grown up and yes. you've had relationships that you've taken your trauma into what did it take for you to realize? Was there this moment that you had where you said, I really need to get, I really need to address my childhood. I really need to address my past so that I can have healthier future relationships. Was there something that happened? Um, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you take losses, I think losses, make you aware of there's something you need to do different. Um, I think I've gotten better with each relationship that I've entered or that I've lost. So I don't think it's one, you know, one case that I say that, that made me think like, oh, I need to work on something different. I think right now, still today, that I'm, I still have stuff to work on. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's right now to this day, like that. I know that there's some there's some areas that I that I need to work on still, because not everything that I do is right. For instance, you know, I I still have um, a problem with communication. You know, I still because of my background and how I grew up, I still have a problem with questioning. You know, like someone asking questions, and I look at it as, as you know, you are you the police? Why are you prying? Why are you doing this instead of and like this person wants to know, uh, you know, just wants some confirmation that wants you know that that when you're in a relationship, you're not in it by so you are required to to answer some questions. You are held to come. That's what relationship does, and I think that's a lot of time where you know myself and others you know, fail in these situations because it, it requires accountability. And right. so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not one thing. It's, this, this is recent stuff, you know, there's no past thing. So yeah, this is, this is up to date information. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, I was reading, or I read something the other day in my live video that I believe it was one in 18 or it was, it was a very low number, but it was one in, I believe, 18 or one in 15 children um, witnessed domestic violence. And then it said that of those one in 15, 80% um, of them, I, I believe that's correct, but it was a high percentage of them actually witnessed the abuse. So it was two different, two different, um, uh, two different things. One in 15 that witness it. So they might be in the room, they might be outside and they hear it. They know what's going on, but they're not visibly seeing it. Um, and so there, there are, you know, there are children every day that are witnessing um, abuse. And I wanted to just read real quickly some of the effects of um, witnessing abuse on children. Um, it says that um, in 2010, so that's what, 12 years ago, um, one in 15 children were exposed to cases of intimate partner violence with a, with a worrying one in three children also experiencing acts of violence. So not only are they witnessing, but they're also experiencing it. So that means that they are actually probably physically being hit. They are probably um, 
dealing with emotional and verbal abuse right along with whoever the, the adult in the house is that's getting abused. Um, and it says some of the effects of um, children that have witnessed domestic violence is anxiety, um, PTSD, mental, mental health strains or mental health diagnosis, aggressive behavior, physical abuse, um, and then the long-term depression, or uh, sorry, the long-term consequences are depression, health problems, and um, uh, PTSD. So um, I know that you just, you said that you are still a work in progress. And yeah. I think that's, that's normal. I'm still a work in progress, even though I feel that I, at this point, I'm a survivor and I'm an advocate, but mm -hmm. I still have triggers and I still go through great things. And I'll tell you, I don't like to be questioned either because I've seen those questions lead, lead, lead to fight. And so I always see multiple questions as being argumentative and combative. Um, so once you start asking me a bunch of questions, um, especially in a relationship, it, it becomes triggering for me. So I definitely understand how, um, you know, every, if you, once you've um, witnessed domestic violence, or once you've gone through any kind of traumatic experience, there's always going to be some reminder, whether it's a song, whether it's a movie, whether it's just seeing that person again, especially if it's, you know, dad or mom, things are going to trigger those negative feelings. And it's just really up to us to do that personal work, um, to be able to know how to cope with those, those triggers and how to um, deal with the things that remind us of the abuse, even in relationships. Um, so when you enter into relationships or you are starting to get serious about um, someone, you know, in an intimate way, do you talk about your past and your traumas to help the person understand maybe some things that you may display or may, might be bringing into the relationship? Do you have those kind of conversations? Um, and do you think they're important? Say that last part again. So do you go into relationships? So when you know that you are about to go into a relationship with someone, do you discuss your past and the trauma that you dealt with? And do you feel that that's important for someone who has experienced trauma um, or, you know, domestic violence to talk about it when they enter into relationships? Well, it's a slippery slope. I'm going to say this um, because I've been in situations where I'm an open book and I say certain things and I talk about my past, I talk about my upbringing and things like that. The wrong person has used my past as ammunition to shoot me with later. Yeah. So that and doesn't feel good. Like it, it kind of crushes you to know that you, you, you were open. You trusted this person with this is what I grew up saying, this was my lifestyle, this was that. And then once they get upset and mad, they say, oh, this is, you know, they they use that. Um, but today I still find it important to be able to be open and have discussions about, hey, this is why I react to certain things or this is what has happened to me. Or yes, I am, um, I have PTSD. Um, and, you know, trying to let people know where that comes from, you know, where that where that comes from. Or if they see something, they don't understand it and it's being able to explain it. Um, so saying that, I feel like, you know, the individual should eventually get in a space where they feel like they can trust the person. I don't think you come out on the first date or so saying that, but as you said, as you see things are getting serious, then you have that discussion. Um, you have you definitely have that discussion. Um, kind of let them know, you know, what's going on, what they could be dealing with and things like that. And kind of give that person the opportunity to respond or, you know, if they want to be around or bother, you know, I, I say so, the sooner the better um, before it gets too deep or uh, whatever. Um, you know, and so yeah, you know, I still I still am an open book, but I'm I'm very cautious of what I 
what I say because there's there's people who have related trauma to me um, that I wouldn't dare speak of. You know what I mean? They'll bring back up. Even when I get mad at them or we get mad, I never I never want to bring that up because I know that that crushes. Um, for domestic violence, yes. Um, and I look at it as, as a double edge because um, I've been in some situations where, you know, females have been cheated on real bad and things like that. And it's like they on high alert for any little thing, you know, and I know what it is. It's just the triggers of their past or that past relationship got them on high alert. It's not what I'm doing. It's what they've dealt with. So, you know, you, you try to be understanding with that um, and domestic violence, you know what I mean? And so if I move or raise my voice or do something a certain way and it triggers her and I'm not understanding, like, why is she getting so scared? Da, 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 but she has never told me that right. she experienced domestic violence. So I don't know. Right. And so now that I want to ensure her, like, look, I ain't going to, jump on you, I ain't going da 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 but she's explaining to me, well, this is a trigger for me. And, you know, both have to, if we care about each other, we both have to help each other work through those triggers. Now, it's not the mate's responsibility 100%, but we do bear responsibility on trying, you know, some responsibility on trying to help that person still through that trauma if we plan on being in their life. So to you again it's like yeah i think you should have that conversation um both about you know past traumas um and domestic violence yeah you know yeah yeah i um i i, I totally agree with you um i do feel that and i have experienced that where i talked to someone told them about my past told them about you know the abuse, abuse the molestation you know being raped so forth and so on it's that's a lot like I've been through a lot and that's a lot to tell somebody. And that's definitely not something that you talk about right out the gate. <laughs> definitely not something you talk right out the gate. Um, um, but I do agree with you that it's, it's a good time to have that relationship. I mean, sorry, it's a good time to talk about it. Um, once you trust that person and also choosing the right time and the right person to share it with. Cause I've had that happen to me too, where I've talked to someone about my, um, my trauma and my past and, you know, the things that I've been through. And just like you said, something happens and they throw it back up in your face. And honestly, that, that can be emotional abuse as well, because that person is, is, is intentionally saying things and doing things. Um, knowing that it's going to hurt you. So there is a fine line when it comes to what is abusive and what's not abusive when it comes to verbal and emotional. But mm -hmm. if it is intentional to hurt you, then it can be it can be considered verbal and emotional abuse. So that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel good for you to trust somebody and you open up to them and you tell them something because obviously you care about them if you're telling them something like that. Um, and then for them to later throw it up in your face um, is not a healthy relationship at all. No matter which 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 way you look at it, it's not a healthy relationship to throw something up in someone's um, face that is traumatic, whether you're angry or not. Um, I also can say that you can't you can't um, tell your whole story until you. And what you said, I'm sorry, I went blank there for a minute. You have to make sure that when you are telling your story, whether it's to someone intimate, whether it's a friend, whether, you know, you're talking in a group, um, just being able to share that kind of information with someone is a privilege as well. The person receiving that information or receiving your story should see that as an honor and a privilege that you're sharing that with them, because that's not something that you just go around you don't go to work talking about your trauma. You don't, you know, you're not out with the boys talking about your trauma. So when you do talk about it, then that person should understand the importance of your message and what it is that you're trying to say. Um, but then also when you do share it 
and they abuse that privilege. Um, it's not a good feeling, but it's also very, very unhealthy. So then you're in that cycle again of, okay, now I'm back into an unhealthy relationship. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know that I would love for us to get together again to talk about, you know, having that conversation with your intimate partner and those needs from your intimate partner when you talk to them about your past trauma. Because I think that it's really important that when we get into relationships, and especially ones that turn into marriage or you're living with someone or you have children with someone, that your partner is able to also understand your trauma and that your partner right. is also able to help you with your triggers and that your partner is also able to comfort and support you. Um, and if they're not able to, for them to be honest about it so that you know how to move forward. Because if they're right. going to be your partner in life, you're going to need them to be your partner in your healing journey as well. Um, what? I think that that's something that we definitely should follow up on and talk about. Well, one thing I would say before we go that I that I definitely suggest that I will do um, in my next serious situation, um, I definitely will have put on the table being able to go to some type of counseling early um, together. Um, right. Because a lot of times when we when we go to counseling, it's like when the house is on fire. <laughs> you know, right. we don't go okay. when. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't go as a prevent, we go as defense. You know what I mean? It's like, no, we're, it's nothing going on, but we want to go and, and and talk about these things together, work on these, you know, have this couple um, therapy moving forward before we even start talking about marriage and things like that. So we can get some of this stuff out. We can be able to speak um, to someone professionally, um, not only, you know, as an individual, but as a unit, um, because I think, you know, one of the things that we don't do is we don't we don't seek help uh, until, you know, divorce and and things are on the table. And a lot of times I'm not saying it's too late, but it it, it, it it's a lot of burnt up real estate in that uh, relationship. <laughs> and, yeah. 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 Um, I, my my one of my things is to say is like, you know, if you're in a, a serious situation or you're moving into one. And you know that there's some trauma and things that you haven't healed from and letting your partner know, but actually going in to speak with somebody so he, he or she can understand what you are dealing with from a third party so that right. they can maybe get some type of, um, you know, some, some type of, you know, help on how they can deal with it and they can help, you know, and vice versa for both parties. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I have a young lady that um, I met through one of my um, mentor groups, and she was telling me that um, she had, did not tell her husband until they were married that she was raped while they were engaged. And I just looked at her and I'm like, how could you not have that conversation before you got married? And of course, he felt some kind of way that she didn't talk to him about it and didn't trust him with that, you know, that kind of information. But then once she did tell him, he didn't know how to handle it. And that caused problems in the relationship. Even, you know, it, it affected them, you know, their intimate relationship as well, their sexual relationship as well. And so it's really, really important that we do talk to our partners and that we do talk to um, our, our person about, you know, our traumas. And for them to be able to educate themselves, for us to educate them. Um, I know that whenever I've gotten into a serious relationship, um, my mom <laughs> has initiated conversations and talked to whoever, you know, it was that I was serious with and said, you know, my daughter has a lot of things that she dealt with. And are you ready for that? And sometimes that conversation came before I could even have the conversation, but she recognized, <laughs> she recognized that it was somebody that I was in a serious relationship with um, right. or was going that way. So um, it, yes, it's just really, really important to have those conversations um, and then for your partner to be able to support you. So I definitely would love for us to come together again, to talk about, you know, having those conversations and what those conversations look like. 
Um, and then also, you know, talking about how couples can together work on having a healthy relationship, even though there's trauma in um, one of the spouses or both of the spouses. I've seen marriages, you know, in my uh, social work career where both people in the relationship have had trauma or childhood mm -hmm. trauma. Um, and it's just, it's explosive. Neither mm -hmm. one has dealt with it. And so now they're in a relationship with two, two people who are dealing, have not dealt with their traumas. And you can imagine how their arguments are, how, you know, how, how everything just blows up immediately and is, you know, overkill. Um, it's probably not the right word, okay, but you know what I mean? <laughs> wow. That everything is just so intense when you have yeah. two, people, two people in a relationship who have not dealt with past trauma, especially childhood trauma. So um, yes, yes, I'm, uh, I definitely want us to get together um, and follow up and have that conversation because it's definitely uh, one that needs to be had. Um, yes, so tell us what you have going on. Tell people where they can see you and find you um, so that they uh, know who Sean Smart is and everything that you do outside of being an advocate for healthy relationships. Oh, uh, okay. Well, you can find me on... Um, all my social media platforms at I am Smart Sean. Um, like I said, I am an advocate, uh, entrepreneur. One of the things that I am a passionate about is besides relationships, is business, entrepreneurship. And so being able to help those um, that are either thinking about a business, trying to start a business, um, you know, whether it be e-commerce, short-term rentals, um, or just some ideas, you know, this is something that I'm passionate about and people can reach out to me on, on all those platforms and anything they may have in mind, just, you know, just, just hit me up. Um, because I know that true wealth is built, um, by, um, you know, making money in your sleep. And so, and our community, black community, we, you know, we, a lot of us haven't grasped that concept, but a lot of us have. And I want to to do it, and, you know, I want to help as many people as I can, even at my position. I'm I'm not no multimillionaire, nowhere near it, but just my inspiration and my inspired to to help us as a all. I think Jay Z said it best, you know, what's better than one billionaire? He said two. You know, until we get it's okay to to uh to help even where you are right now. Um, cause a lot of us think I got to get it first, but we can get it together. You right. know, you got to hold information or show me something. It's, a, it's billions of people out here. There's enough customers for all. That's true. That's very true. That's very true. Well, thank you again for coming on with us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you again. This was a long time coming. So we, when we get off here, we're going to schedule the next one so that we can continue these, um, type of relationships. I'm sorry these types of conversations <laughs> on time tonight, conversations um, about relationships and having healthy relationships and having these kind of um, direct intimate talks that need to be had when it comes to, um, when it comes to couples and when it comes to even our personal life, you know, we really do have to work on ourselves and make sure that we are in a good space before we go into relationships. Um, and even no one's perfect, no one's perfect, but uh, we really do have to work on ourselves um, as we go into relationships, because everyone has baggage, but we want to make sure it's baggage that, um, we can, that we can cope with and that we can handle, um, in a healthy way. What were you about to say? I uh, just wanted to, you know, what you're saying that I just want, you know, anyone listening to know that, yeah, we got to work on ourselves, but, um, it's going to it's always going to be a work in progress. I just say I don't want people to think cuz a lot of times you think oh I got to be perfect, or I got to be ready for I start that day. No. Uh, you just you got you can work on yourself but you know uh, um nobody's going to be complete. You know what I mean? If you uh, so just try to work on yourself and do the best you can. Everything else will work out itself, I think, when you get with the right person. That right That's mate. True. That's true. That's very, very true. I totally agree.
Um, please stay on with us as we go into our business spotlight. So, um, Sean, stay on with us. And we're going to welcome C. Dwayne Hennett, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Good, 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 good. Um, I know that you had to work today. And so thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, you are our spotlight business and we are in Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I brought you on because you wrote a book, The Ripple Effect. And so I would love for you to share it with um, our guests and our audience and tell them about your book um, and you as an advocate and what you do. Sure. Um, so about, it's been about three years, I think, is uh, I've, I've written a book. Um, it's called The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effects of Domestic Violence. Um, it shines a spotlight on the different effects of domestic violence. Um, it starts uh, the, with the pathology of domestic violence, how it starts, how, how it ends, um, and everybody that it affects. So I wrote it from a novice point of view, uh, because when I, when I was going through um, being in different relationships as far as marriages, um, I had noticed that I, I had uh, a lot of relationships that ended and I had did some self-evaluation and, uh, the key factor that was in those relationships that the, the, the people that I had dated had been abused. And I had a couple of friends that had been abused. Um, and so that kind of lit a fire in me as far as wanting to be an advocate. Right. Um, so I know that I met you um, through, you know, our, our advocate circle and tell us, I remember that you were telling us that you were invited to something. It was related to your job. Um, and that's really where you were able to really understand um, domestic violence and the effects of domestic violence. Tell us about that experience. Yeah. So um, I've been advocating for about 11 years. My first um, four year into um, being an advocate was I had a job at the city of Durham um, in the human relations department. Um, and they had a uh, domestic violence task force. And I was on the uh, board for that. I was the uh, vice chair for that. And so we had different files that would come in of different people seeking help. And so you start seeing different files of people that were looking for help, looking for resources or assistance um, to get out of their uh, abusive relationship. And so that's how I got started with it was with the job working for the city of Durham in North Carolina. Um, after working with them uh, for a while, you know, I wanted to do more. Um, I wanted to be involved in my community because at the time domestic violence was hitting Durham um, as a community pretty hard. Um, you will see it just in, you know, um, and you will see it in just in um, different places because one of the things that I saw was is that you, we have a, um, a huge Hispanic uh, community here in Durham. So you would have women who didn't, who could b barely speak English, um, and they were trying to get out of their situation, um, but they didn't have any resources. Some of them were undocumented, um, some of them were documented, um, but they were just in a, a bad situation, and they were looking for help. Yeah, um, I know that, and that's a that's a really. I'm glad you brought that to our attention. Is that um, domestic violence happens in every race? It's not mm -hmm. just a a, a black problem. It's not a Mexican problem. It's not a white problem. It is a problem, period. It's a national problem. Um, and so we saw, and I'm sure that you saw this too, with COVID-19 and people being um, restricted and isolated that the domestic violence numbers went up. And again, that was across all cultures that domestic violence increased the last two years. Um, so how has that been for you as an advocate seeing the increase um, in working with um, and working with victims? H how has that changed for you or is it kind of the same thing that you're doing pre-COVID? Well, the, the pandemic brought a lot of things out as far as domestic violence. So you found out that um, a lot more people were in abusive relationships. Um, and you found out a lot more, a lot of people were in toxic relationships. So toxic relationship is something that I think is a key factor in as far as domestic violence and abuse. Uh, when you have a, a toxic relationship, it also feeds into the fact that you have uh, a mate that uh, more than likely will abuse you or uh, um, 
mistreat you in some cer certain kind of ways. Um, so you have people that probably were in a toxic relationship who hadn't been in who hadn't been in a house together, didn't know each other's traits, and the abuser, you know, couldn't get out. So he couldn't get out to either cheat, he couldn't get out to either, you know, drink, or he just couldn't get out at all um, to work. So they're stuck in the house with the person that they've been abusing, um, mistreating um, um, for a whole year. Um, in some cases, probably two years. I know in my case, um, I work from home. I'm still working from home. So I've been I haven't, um, I'm just recently going back onto my job probably in uh, the next three weeks. So I haven't been, you know, in a live uh, uh, place in over two years. Um, so there's some people that, that haven't been out and you saw increases of numbers because it was just a, a, a powder keg as far as people being together and, you know, just being around certain kind of abusers all the time. It was something that was, uh, never seen before because you not only had to deal with the pandemic, but you also have to deal with everyday, everyday abuse or everyday kind of violence um, that was right. going on in your home. So you saw an increase of people that needed more therapy, which I totally agree with. Um, but it was, it's a shame that the pandemic had to bring that part out of it for domestic violence and abuse. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I know uh, being a social worker and working in the, um, the community, we definitely saw the effects of um, people, well, learning more about abusive relationships, toxic relationships. And, you know, we were, I was talking to Sean earlier that even someone who is intentionally bringing up your abuse in the past and using that against you to hurt you, can, can be seen as verbally and emotionally abusive. Um, you know, people say, oh, they're toxic. So that means that you realize that you're in an unhealthy relationship. And usually toxic relationships just continue to escalate and escalate and escalate until somebody gets hit, somebody gets pushed, someone is cussed out, or they're treated very badly. Something, there's eventually something that blows up when you have a toxic relationship. Um, and so recognizing the signs of domestic violence or recognizing the signs of an abusive relationship, I think is just so important for us to talk about um, in our community because I hear the word toxic all the time. And people go, girl, you're in that, you're in a toxic, that, that, that relationship is toxic. Okay, so why are we not having these conversations about why you're still in, these, in this relationship before it blows up? Um, you know, just because you wanna be with somebody? So, you know, it's really important, you know, that we talk about the, the things that lead up to the abuse and the action and the, the, the characteristics of what can lead to a domestic violence relationship or an abusive relationship. And when you start saying things like that, I'm in a toxic relationship, you know, he makes me feel this way or she makes me feel this way. You know, they, they do things that intimidate me. I, you know, I, I was with somebody, he didn't, he never physically hit me, but he would hit around me, right? So he would hit just passing my face and punch the wall. So it wasn't that he was hitting me, but he was letting me know that he wanted to. Um, and so, you know, just those kind of things, it's really important for us to talk about and have conversations about is what are the signs, knowing the signs and trying to get out before it turns deadly. Um, so I just think that those are the conversations that we definitely, definitely need to, to, um, to, uh, to talk about. Tell us about your book, The Ripple Effect. Why, why did you, what was, what was the reason for you writing it? And um, what has been the response of your book? Well, the, the, the reason for, uh, the reason, the reason why I wrote the book, like I said, I had, my story is I've been married four times um, and each one of those marriages, except for the last one, um, ended. Um, and uh, pre-domestic violence on the previous uh, relationship that they had before contributed to it. Um, you talk about um, toxic relationships. Now, one of the things that I put in my book is that a toxic relationship would infect all other relationships. So they weren't healed from their relationships that they had from, a, from an abusive uh, 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 mate that they had. And so it contributed to the downfall of my marriage and uh, our, our marriages and stuff like that. So 
you see things like that in my book. You see how it affects everybody else. So I wanted to bring that 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 part into it. When I made the ripple effect, it's it's one ripple, but it has different ways to it. So everything that's in my books uh, talks about that. Is is it's the fact that domestic violence can have different ripples and can affect different things. I talk about it from the point of a child. I talk about how the media plays into the fact of domestic violence. It perpetrates um, unhealthy relationships, um, rom-coms and stuff like that. You know, one of the one of the things I talk about was a, a movie that I that I liked as a teenager when I was growing up. It was called Baby Boy um, as an adult. Um, I looked at I looked back at that movie and I was like, wow, this is one of the worst movies as far as relationships ever. And I was like, how did I even like this movie when I was a kid? But like I said, you know, the media plays into, you know, perpetrating, you know, what you think a, a relationship is supposed to be. People think that right. you're supposed to go back and forth in relationships. People are supposed to break up, get back together, break up again. And then it becomes, it becomes a norm where you think that cheating is okay, or you think that people mistreating you in certain ways is okay. So I wanted to address things like that in my book. I wanted to address, you know, how to how to see certain signs of domestic violence, um, how to know what a um, what an abusive man looks like. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in, in my book is that you know when you have somebody, when you're out of that domestic violence relationship, it feels like you're waiting for the next shoe to drop. Right. And if you yeah. if you're truly healed from it, you shouldn't have that type of feeling. You shouldn't have that type of feeling. If you're truly healed from your abusive relationship previously, you shouldn't you shouldn't still like feel like in the next relationship you're waiting for the next shoe to drop as far as somebody abusing you, somebody mistreating you, somebody, you know, cheating on you, somebody lying on you. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you shouldn't. And we talked to Sean, we were talking about that earlier, um, about exactly what you just said. So um I'm really happy that you um, you wrote your book. I read your book. Um, it's very um, direct and very easy to read and very easy to understand. Um, and I think that it's it's a really good book for people who um, really need to understand um, domestic violence and the effects of domestic violence um, on relationships and on a person as an individual and how they go into relationships with with all of this trauma and all of this, you know, baggage and all of these things that they haven't addressed yet. And then they take it into the relationship and now they're in this relationship and it's toxic and it's unhealthy. And you've got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and you don't know who you're in a relationship with um, because you haven't, you haven't dealt with the broken pieces. You haven't, you know, you haven't picked them up. You haven't put yourself back together. And now you're in this, in this relationship. So um, thank you for sharing your um, your book with us, The Ripple Effect. Tell everybody how they can find your book. Um, you can find my a book on Amazon, um, C. Dwayne Hennett, um, The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effects of Domestic Violence. You also can find it on Barnes & Noble. Um, you can contact me on Facebook, um, C. Dwayne Hennett, or on Instagram as well. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I talked to Dwayne earlier about giving away a couple of copies of The Ripple Effect. So um, I am personally going to be giving away two copies of his book, The Ripple Effect. So um, I will have uh, Dwayne pick out two people that either commented, like their heart, our episode tonight, and they are going to be our winners. We will announce the winners after the episode. So thank you for joining us and also donating your books to us so that we can get it out into the community. Um, please tell everyone again how they can get your book. Um, you can find my book on um, Amazon, um, C. Dwayne Hennett, The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effects of Domestic Violence. And you can also find it on Barnes and Noble too. Um, like I said, you still can reach me um, if you want to get a copy of it on my Facebook or my Instagram at C. Dwayne Hennett um, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. While we're talking about that, <laughs> let's talk about the juice of the week. And that is, I don't know if y'all have been watching the news, watching the tabloids, but we have, was it, um, who are you talking about? Blueface and his girlfriend, I don't know how you, how you say her name, Krishan. Um, and they're, they're public fighting, the public of abusiveness, domestic violence, all of that they have going on, the drama they have it going on and they're going back and forth back and forth and now she's released a couple of days ago that uh uh blueface uh, knocked her daddy out 
and reveals that her father um, was abusive to her and her mother as a child. What are your thoughts on that whole thing? And, you know, that's definitely an abusive relationship. What are your thoughts on that relationship? Are you asking me? Both of you. (laughs) Anybody. Uh, That is the most toxic relationship on TV now. And I'm not sure if it's that well. I know it's not. Well, let me put it like this. Just by reading up on her background and his background, um, I know it's not portrayed that way um, for TV. I know it, there really is some some trauma, especially on her side. Um, yeah. If you if you read on her background, I think she is one of eleven kids, mm-hmm. uh, and I think uh, yes, she's one of eleven kids, and and she her mother put her out at twelve. Um, because her father was in jail and she had to fend for herself from 12 until high school. Um, Mm -hmm. But she didn't have a good relationship with her mother and she didn't have a good relationship with her father. Um, As you, as you already stated is that they got into a fight um, before Um, she's, she's been arrested um, for actually stealing this guy's car, her boyfriend. Um, She's, she's been to jail before. So you see how, you know, a, when I say toxic relationship, a toxic relationship just isn't between, you know, a, a, a mate. You can have a toxic mm-hmm. relationship with your parents. You have a toxic mm-hmm. relationship with your kids. You can have a toxic relationship with your friends um, and stuff like that. So when I tell you that, when I say that a toxic relationship will affect all other relationships, it's how you treat other people. So if you're mm-hmm. in a toxic relationship, you're used to treating people this way. And you think that every relationship that you have, you can mistreat somebody or treat them a certain kind of way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, from what I was reading, it seems that both of them got issues. Both of them have some things in the past. Um, both of them are abusive to one another. And yeah. it's just, it's it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, we just had, um, mm, the, the, what was the actor that he just uh, sued his wife for domestic violence? Who was it? Hmm. Uh, the actor. I can't think of a thing. Mm. Uh, it was just in the news. Um, Caucasian actor um, and his, him and his wife were oh. in court. Oh, Johnny Depp. Yes, Johnny Depp. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, these, these relationships, it's, and it, that's a perfect example. Both of these examples are perfect examples of the fact that domestic violence and abusive relationships happen on, on all levels. They happen on celebrity level. They happen on labor um, levels. They happen on, you know, all levels, black and white, no matter, no matter who you are. Um, so yeah, but this thing with Blueface and, and this young lady, um, it's, it's, it's a mess and they really, they really need to, to get some help. They really do both of them individually. And if they're going to be together as a couple, um, but yeah, they are definitely a perfect example of everything that we were talking tonight. Um, and yeah, what about you? What about you, Desan? What's what's your what's your take on this whole thing going on with Blueface? And uh, is it your song? Am I saying her name right? Krishan. Krishan. Okay. What's your take on it? That's our juice. This is our juice of the week. What's your take on it, Desan? <laughs> uh, it's out of control. Um, it's been. It's been out of control for a minute, and of course, because we're in this content era where social media is sort of capital, um, it's played out. Um, and then there's, you know, it's made worse because there's a whole other controversial figure um, in terms of WAC 100, in terms of Blueface's manager who's in the midst of it. Um, there was a whole thing with WAC and her about getting her out of his house. Like this, we have been watching this play out for a while now. The yeah. arrests, um, mm-hmm. you know, the moment where something will happen and everybody's like, okay, and mm-hmm. then you find out that they're back and making appearances together. And it's this, there's a level of codependency that sometimes happen um, mm-hmm. in these kind of situations because mm-hmm. it gets toxic, it falls apart, then there's guilt. Mm-hmm. And then you feel like that you need each other because you understand each other's kind of pain and trauma and you come back together then it falls apart again uh-huh. and I'm actually worried because this is the kind of thing that can end up with someone really getting hurt um, uh, because they've had some really wild fallout fights 
And it's yeah. gotten to the point where it doesn't look like it matters where they are or who right. they are around. And that's when you know that, that trauma, PTSD, like all of that gets really intense. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I feel really bad. Um, um, but I also am really worried about the two of them. Um, yeah. And I just don't know who they have around them is the thing that I'm worried about. Um and who has the ability to be able to step in. Um, and if anybody has that kind of, you know, yeah. like, is there anybody who can kind of step in the midst of this? Yeah. Well, someone well, it's, definitely... become, it's become a profit now. Yeah. It's become a profit now because they have, uh, well, she's on a show and it's, it's supposed to be one of the top rated shows, but I've seen bits and pieces of it. So you see a lot of fighting. Um, a lot of fighting between the, the, the participants on the show. Um, and it, it, it's a shame because, like I said, there's not anybody that, that can be a lending ear to say, hey, you know, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't, you shouldn't be in th- this type of relationship. You, you guys shouldn't engage in this type of uh, actions towards each other. But like I said, it's become a profit now. So nobody's there because there's a lot of people that's making money off of it. So nobody's going to be able to talk them out of it. Somebody's going to be able to talk about their actions. Um, and on her side, she's she's all the way in. I mean, you know, uh, even though we've, we've advanced since then, a tattoo is a, it used to be a permanent thing. But, you mm-hmm. know, she went and got his face tattooed on her neck. I mean, she lost a tooth and she has his face on his tooth. I mean, so you see things like that. And it's like, how how do you talk somebody down when being toxic and being abusive becomes profitable. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 horrible. It's a it's a horrible situation. It's a horrible relationship, and it's all in the news. And it seems like there's no shame at all. Um, and the more that they are hurting each other, abusing each other, taking advantage of each other, the more you're seeing them in the news. So um, I hope that they are able to get some help before somebody gets hurt or killed, um, because I've I've seen it. Just the, the young lady, she's been to jail, like you said. She's attacked people. She, it's just, and he, and he's responding, and he's doing the same thing. They, they're both physically hurting each other. So it's just, it's a very volatile situation. Um, anyway, <laughs> so that was the juice of the week. Uh, Desan, you are going to take us out with your second. Uh, yes, and so I'm gonna. Uh, start with a. Um, a quote from Paolo Coelho from The Alchemist. Uh, Before a dream is realized, the soul of the world tests everything that was learned along the way. It does this not because it is evil, but so that we can, in addition to realizing our dreams, master the lessons we've learned as we move toward that dream. That's the point at which most people give up. It's the point at which, as we say in the language of the desert, one dies of thirst just when the palm trees have appeared over the horizon. Um, this poem is called Alchemy. And I would, wouldn't would want to leave um, in the same place that we began, but more so with some hope about being able to understand that we can uh, craft a different way for ourselves. We are two alchemists, you and I, trying to purify, mature, and perfect our lives, trying to turn dust into wisdom, turn bruises into rainforests, turn sidewalks into flower beds. We managers of elixirs and emotions, paper and words. We blessed dreamers, adept in making miracles out of trash ready to smile at those who believe that we belong amongst the heap. We make breakthroughs out of the road, less travel, pave trials and tribulations with asphalt and believe our destiny is never the destination, but what we learn to bear between the shoulders of the road. I tried everything to help you recognize that there is glory in your presence and not just your practice, that you can be seen for more than what you do and appreciated for more than what you give. So now I sit amongst these sands with elements in hand, trying to mix you a new horizon And when dawn turns to dust, I will paint the words of others across the night sky and hope that you read your belonging in relative constellations. See, I've been reading The Wonder in Your Smile for some time now, held book clubs in recognition of the amazing in God's penmanship. I've given him a heads up for the good work. His nod back is to the baseline of beauty paced by the steps you take into a room, style and grace perfectly placed on beat, turning any floor into a well-versed runway. But because of your past, You seem to think you are disconnected from the dynamic destiny colored your skin long 
after you were born. So I continue to think of ways to remind you that what you have dealt with was never intended to be your burden. It was intended to be affirmation that you are so much more in this hard work when this man's world puts so much effort in trying to remind you, Rib, rather than value your magic, but you are so de deserving, beloved. So I sit here with will and determination, hoping each additive blends perfectly like how your eyes, lips, courage, resilient insight and compassion blends perfectly. See, I choose, I choose these sands to craft this revelation because it is here that my tears and desire for your happiness can turn into a paradise of glass where you will never stop being reminded of the wonder you are for it seems my eyes have not been enough. See, we are two alchemists, you and I, trying to purify, mature and perfect our lives, trying to turn wind and affirmation turn mistakes into waterfalls, turn parking lots into embraces. But what good is ability? If all I can do is watch this world make you question how powerful of a blessing you become. But what I do know is that what we have at our disposal is a wonderful kind of sorcery, a wonderful kind of science, an amazing way for us to be able to craft a beautiful tomorrow that no one will ever be able to take away from us. Wow, that was beautiful. That was that was very, very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Tell everybody how they can find you again, and we'll go ahead and close out with our closing song. Uh, yes. Uh, once again, you can find me, Dasana Hanu, across all platforms. That's D-A-S-A-N-A-H-A-N-U. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Um, we're going to close out with Take a Journey with Me by Jean Mason. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you again, Gene Mason. Everybody, please follow Gene Mason on Facebook and Instagram, also on iHeartRadio and iTunes. Um, that really, really makes me think about my new book that's coming out, Earn Your Wings, A 30-Day Journey from Survivor to Advocate. It is now available for pre-order and is going to be published officially on October 31st. Please check it out on my website at tiffanylbrown.com.